Good afternoon. Can you all hear me okay? Great. Um, it is an honor and privilege to welcome again Dr. Lisa Lowe to Brooklyn College. I am Diana Pan, Associate Professor of Sociology here at the college. I'm also the co-chair of the Asian American Faculty and Staff Association and leading the Asian American Studies Working Group. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the land on which Brooklyn College sits, which is home to the Lenape, the Lenape peoples, and acknowledge the history and contributions of the Wekajik on whose land I reside. As we gather here over Zoom, the borough of Brooklyn has experienced a 43% increase in the Asian American population since 2010. At over 11% of the borough's current population, Asian Americans have and are transforming Brooklyn. We learned a lot about these efforts from the previous session where panelists spoke about food, policing, religion, and basic human rights, among other topics. Locally, Brooklyn College has seen our share of increase in Asian American students who currently represent roughly 25 to 40% of the student body, depending on how individuals identify. While the college houses some established ethnic studies program, programs, we have room for growth, especially to concertedly invest in developing Asian American studies curriculum. My own intellectual curiosity was piqued as an undergrad in ethnic studies courses. In fact, I first encountered Dr. Lowe's work in Asian American studies courses and was tremendously inspired. Her work has since nurtured my own thinking and affected my interests. For this session, Dr. Elisa Lowe, Samuel Knight Professor of American Studies at Yale University and Brooklyn College's Hess Scholar in Residence this week, expert on colonialism, history and diaspora, will be in conversation with esteemed Brooklyn College colleague, Dr. Mustafa Bayomi, professor of English with expertise in American studies, Muslim, Muslim Americans, and is a regular contributor to the New York Times, CNN.com, New York Magazine, among, and among other outlets. Both scholars will provide us with a primer on Asian American studies. What is it? Um, why is it important in our country's history and current moment? What are the major trends in research and teaching? And what are the current challenges to developing and sustaining such curricula? This conversation will surely enlighten the BC campus on the value of Asian American studies and its place in American academia. So without further ado, I turn this session over to our presenters, Dr. Lisa Lowe and Dr. Mustafa Bayomi. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. And I want to welcome you all and thank you all for coming and especially welcome and thanks to Professor Lisa Lowe, whose work is not only um, is highly, highly important in the fields, so many fields, especially in including Asian American studies, um, diaspora studies, studies around capitalism and migration, all of these. Um, but also just really important to my own work. Um, I've been reading Lisa Lowe's work since I was a graduate student. And in fact, I'm fortunate enough to have known Lisa Lowe since I was a graduate student. So this is uh, personally a delight for me as well. Um, and uh, uh, thank you also, Diana, for that lovely introduction. And I think that one of the ways that we're going to uh, um, address a lot of the questions that you raise in, um, in the introduction around Asian American studies, I think the, I was thinking maybe one really, uh, really eloquent way to get through that would be to think about the, the go through the intellectual genealogy of Professor Lisa Lowe herself um, and work through, in fact, the books uh, that, that Lisa Lowe has, has published. And um, from, we can see, I think, also the growth, not just of her own intellectual trajectory, but really also where Asian American studies has, has come from where it is, and where it is going by doing so. So in the spirit of that, I wanna first of all say a formal hello to Lisa. And I'll begin with my first question. So, and that question is, you know, how did your intellectual uh, past, your intellectual ways of being educated, your, your own thought processes, how did all of that lead to your first book, Critical Terrains? And, and what made the study of Orientalism you know, and myself, this is my class here is coming to this conversation uh, and that's a, that's a post-colonial studies class, so even more relevant. But what made the study of Orientalism interesting to you and how did your work draw on and depart from the work of Edward Said in that early book of yours? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much. And um, let me just also uh, 
thank Diana and Professor Rosamund King, um, Anthony Bianco, of course, uh, it's, they've just been wonderful and, and arranged things so beautifully. And um, let me say also, it's a pleasure to be in conversation with you, Mustafa. I think we met in 1991 when you were a student of Professor Edward Said, um, and he had written in 1978, is it? The Orientalism, um, so which was the topic of my first book. Um, and, uh, you know, I, let me just say, um, he was an extraordinary thinker and person, um, both brilliant and courageous. And I always had enormous respect for him. Um, and my, my first book, of course, was really indebted to his book, Orientalism. Um, so as you know, I taught at UC San Diego for 25 years uh, in comparative literature. And I first met Edward Said um, in the early, early to mid 1990s when he would come for two weeks to UC San Diego to do a distinguished visitorship. And given my seminar topics on colonialism and Orientalism, um, when I was an assistant professor, he would often join my seminar. And for those two weeks, I would be you know, in awe and just marvel at his intellectual command and breadth. And I remember he would lecture extemporaneously um, on Fanon, on Lukács, on Raymond Williams without notes. And it was just incredibly inspiring. Um, but this, this is a bit of a digression. My first book, Critical Terrains on French and British Orientalisms, of course, took up the notion of Orientalism uh, as a Western colonial discourse that classified and administered and created knowledge about cultures uh, of peoples it, it colonized um, and in the Middle East, North Africa, and Asia. Um, but uh, so I was very drawn to that topic after reading Orientalism, but in my own work, I guess I departed somewhat from Edward Said by suggesting that perhaps Orientalism wasn't as monolithic as he suggested it was, um, that it was an unstable discourse and could be contested and refuted. Uh, and also that it could be flexibly deployed in various ways to, um, so for example, casting internal others like women or the proletariat as oriental threats. Um, so uh, yeah, so that's, that's how I came to that topic. <laughs> he also yeah, visited, but... when I was a graduate student at um, UC Santa Cruz, he visited then as well and gave seminars. Yeah, I remember actually. If I uh, there was a conference that I think was actually the, the where I first met you in the early '90s, um, and Edward was there, and I remember him praising your work uh, explicitly and talking about how it had it had expanded, um, especially the notion of women in, under Orientalism, in key ways. Uh, mm -hmm. I think there are sometimes there are. And especially these days now, because there's a new um, uh, intellectual biography that has just been published around Edward's life. Uh, it's meant a recalling of a lot of Edward Said's work, some of which I feel have become sort of cheap pot shots and some of which are more sustained in, in engagements. Um, and I think one of the more sustained engagement, he was always willing to en engage with uh, people who are critical of his work. And I think that uh, critical terrains really offered that, um, that opportunity for him as well. And it's still, you know, for, for me, one of the things that's remarkable about critical terrains too is, um, I'm sorry if people hear that siren in the background, I'm gonna, this is still the over-policed Brooklyn <laughs> until it passes. It's, <sighs> but one of the remarkable things about critical terrains for me was the ways in which it still remains um, so relevant as well. And I, I was, Read, I was looking it over the other day and, and I just remember this sentence then from the, from, the, from the preface, in fact, and it says this. Even so, as I write this, which is in the early 90s, I am forced by recent events in the Persian Gulf to acknowledge the persistent legacy of Orientalism. These events demand that questions of resistance be more than theoretical and remind us that despite practical resistance, newly configured Orientalisms 
will continue to demand our critical attention. I, I find it amazing and unfortunate, really, how repetitive our history seems. I mean, those same lines could have been written, you know, yesterday. They could have been written 10 years ago. They could have been written 20 years ago. We're, you know, we're talking in the early 90s. And I don't know if Absolutely. you can make anything about that. What, 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 does that mean? what does this persistent Orientalism mean about, about who we are? Oh, well, of course, so the book, that, that book was published in 1991 after the Persian Gulf crisis, uh, when the US responded to Saddam Hussein by sending, uh, when he sent Iraqi troops into Kuwait by beginning the first Gulf War, um, which of course was, uh, I don't wanna say it inaugurated because I'm sure there was covert stuff that was going on before then, but we were, we were just all too familiar with the subsequent um, wars and invasions and occupations in Iraq and throughout the Middle East um, after that, um, including the 2003 invasion um, and the so-called war on terror. Um, so unfortunately, the, you know, the way Saeed discussed Orientalism as the, um, the creation of a discourse of otherness um, in order to, uh, you know, he was drawing a lot on Foucault, I think, the way in which discourses of knowledge, of study, actually are material processes of commanding and objectifying. Um, and of course, that continues over and over again. Um, you know, in the 18th and 19th century, Orientalism was mostly focused on Turkey and Egypt and the Middle East, in the 19th century on uh, North Africa, and in the 20th century, well, the first three quarters of the 20th century, East Asia, Southeast Asia. And then of course, in the last quarter and of the 20th century and the 21st century, refiguring again, Arabs, Muslims, and South Asians. And it's, um, I mean, I, I suppose this is one of the things I was trying to argue that it's a malleable, flexible discourse that's opportunistically used. Um, but of course, uh, it's not the fault of the discourse itself, the discourse, confirms and maintains and socially reproduces the, so the arrangements that military power utilizes in order to uh, go to war and to create enemies and to continually divide populations into friend and enemy, as, as you've written so much about. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I feel like, um, you know, Orientalism is as much uh an illustration of power as it is an exercise of power. So as long as the US is engaged in, in its kinds of ways around the world, Orientalism will continue to be with us. In a way, Orientalism, one could say that Orientalism is kind of like James Bond in that it will never die. It just doesn't seem to die. Yeah. And both of which are both products of empire in a way yeah. too, right? I mean, we forget the, I think the James, the maybe we don't, but the imperial roots of James Bond as an idea also should never be forgotten. Uh, Nevertheless, moving on. Um, let's let's move on also to Immigrant Acts, um, which uh, was a phenomenally important book and really established, I think, an, um, ways of thinking about not just um, literary texts but also uh, legal texts and like thinking about the ways in which we understand immigration in this country in a complex way. What, what brought you to this shift to look at Asian immigration and immigrant, immigrant acts? It's, it's, it, is, it is a departure from looking at Orientalism in, um, in critical terrains. What, what motivated that turn? I wonder if you could tell us. And also about the methodology and examination of race and how that becomes more central in your work, along with looking at the role of the state. So what would you say mo moved you from sort of post-colonial criticism to Asian American studies? And, and what, if anything, is gained by, by that move? Um, that's interesting because I actually wrote Immigrant Acts at the same time I was writing Critical Terrain. So it, it didn't seem like a transition to me. It seemed very much like, um, you know, that I was always interested in race and colonialism. Uh, in the Critical Terrain's case, you know, uh, it was French and British Orientalism. In, in the case of Asian Americans, it was the U.S., and the US at war in Asia and the US racializing um, Asian immigrants. Um, but the way I, I, I started, so I never took courses in Asian American studies. You know, I went to graduate school in the early 80s. Um, 
but I, uh, when I started teaching at UC San Diego, there was no Asian American studies there at the time. So um, a math professor who happened to be Asian American <laughs> asked me, could you, you know, could you start teaching a few classes in this area? Uh, so even though uh, I was hired to teach comparative literature, I began teaching courses in Asian American studies um, and was eventually part of a group which uh, sought to establish Asian American studies and ethnic studies at UC San Diego in the 80s. And um, I learned a lot from teaching Asian American studies courses, and I learned a lot from my students and their experiences and histories, which were extremely uh, different from my own, not extremely, but different than my own. My parents um, came to the U.S. during World War II. Many of them came after 1965 and the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1965. Um, so I learned an enormous amount from them. Uh, and as a result, I wrote Immigrant Acts at the same time I was working on critical trains. Um, so it, it didn't feel to me like it was a transition in that way. And um, it seemed like they were linked projects, that one was about European Orientalism and one what in a way was about uh, US Orientalism. But also I often also think about Immigrant Acts as um, uh, a kind of history, uh, looking at the, um, the history of racial capitalism in the US, but with an eye to the Asian American example and what Asian immigration and the series of experiences that Jap Chinese, Japanese, Filipinos, uh, Koreans had of both being, you know, all of these groups being first enlisted as non-citizen low-wage labor, then being then being greeted by anti-Asian uh, violence, and then being barred from further immigration, and also barred from citizenship until the mid twentieth century. So. Um, what does this, it, you know, on my mind at the time was this question of what does the history of Asian immigration uh, before 1965, but also, you know, actually up to the 1980s, what does that tell us about the history of capitalism? And I think, you know, one of the answers is that Asian Americans are not the only group to have been uh, indispensable to the building of the U.S. economy. Uh, but uh, exploited as low-wage non-citizen labor. Um, and it, it tells us something about how um, the building of the economy always needed uh, insecure, uh, vulnerable non-citizen labor. <laughs> that, that, I mean, this happened repeatedly to different Asian groups, but of course we've seen it happen with um, Mexican workers, Central American workers, uh, workers from the Caribbean, uh, workers from now from Africa, and so forth. So um, I think it's it's about Asian Americans, and it's very much about Asian American culture, but it's also about um, certain processes of of uh, how the state racializes non citizen labor in order to uh, build the economy. Yeah, that's so interesting. It's, I, 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 what I find interesting about that too is, um, um, you know, this is a bit departing a little bit, but um, maybe, but uh, you come essentially from a European intellectual um, history tradition, right? And, and someone like say Gary Okahiro, who's also a kind of like formidable force in Asian American studies comes out of an African studies tradition or Evelyn Hugh de Hart coming out of like uh, the Caribbean studies tradition. Right? Yeah. And, yeah. and these, are, these are the people who are become the, the real mainstays of Asian American um, uh, studies. And, and I don't know, what does it mean for people who have, who have you know, are seen as the, the sort of progenitors of the field not to have been trained in it? Because you say that you were never trained in Asian American studies and, and, um, and but then you were, you were brought into it. I don't know, does that make, does it, does that produce a different kind of Asian American studies than the kind of Asian American studies that gets produced by programs that produce Asian American studies? I'm, I don't know what you asked. That's me. a fascinating question. I mean, I think it wasn't a choice on our part. Um, you know, we probably all would have studied Asian American studies if it had been available, um, but it wasn't. And so we had to make do and, and teach ourselves in certain ways. 
Um, but I think, you know, to, to take your question as a metaphor in a way, um, I, do, I do think it's, in, it's very, very important to, um, to think about Asian Americans and, and to study Asian Americans in the context of other groups um, and, and to think globally about Asian Americans. So um, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't surprise me that, um, that Gary found, found his way from African studies to Asian American studies and, to, and continues to see those links. I mean, his latest book was on uh, third world studies and he continues to see Asian Americans in a, in a larger frame, not just be as racialized in the US, but also uh, in relationship to the longer histories of colonialism in the global South. And of course, the beginnings of uh, Asian American studies did come out of um, solidarity with third world decolonization movements. Um, and, um, and that was the origin of the ethnic studies programs, for example, at UCLA and Berkeley. But, um, you know, I think um, going back to what I was saying about how uh, immigrant acts is about Asian Americans. It certainly isn't. It, it certainly wasn't meant to say that it's only. It's a very um, unique experience to have been uh, recruited as as non citizen labor and then to be barred and banned. I mean, as you know well. I mean, also you know, Asians were not the first group to be made wartime racial enemies <laughs> um, or the last one. I mean, the treatment of Arab Muslims and South Asians after 9-11, as you've written, resembles this earlier treatment of East and Southeast Asians, um, particularly the Japanese Americans in World War II, 120,000 of whom were incarcerated in wartime camps. Yeah. So it's very important not to exceptionalize Asian Americans as much as we want to understand the details and the particularities of the history and the particularities of the struggles of our communities today. Um, it's always really important to understand our history in relation to other groups. Absolutely. Um, I mean, if, and if we think uh, just two quick responses to that, too, which is, you know, if, if we think about um, the Supreme Court recently authorizing Donald Trump's Muslim ban, but in so doing, actually repudiating Japanese internment, even though, in fact, those two things are, in fact, deeply connected, not, and, yeah. and is this the bad conscience of a liberal, like, flight from fancy, what you, if you will, to think that they can somehow um, erase one wrong by producing another. Uh, it, it just strikes me as a, a, a continuation of a certain kind of of, of, of bad faith American racial state happening right then and there. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't want to digress too much, but I don't know if you, I know you write for The Guardian, but I don't know if you saw Judith Butler's re recent piece. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, one of the things that she comments is that these far right and what she calls, frankly, fascist kinds of programs um, aren't coherent. <laughs> I mean, that's one of their distinguishing features is the, is the incoherence. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, um, and I think that the, the, as you were saying too, the, building those connections between different, uh, not just populations, but also different state formations, I think is really, really crucial too. And the, you know, even the, the, the rise of coolie labor with the end of uh, slavery in the Caribbean too, I think bears a lot of connection to what you're saying. And, and the ways in which that also looking at it through a kind of global lens allows us to de-exceptionalize the United States as a site as well. So that moves me then into a, into a question, I guess, around, uh, your, the following book, you know, how, how does the intimacies of four continents um, sort of draw on and then depart from, say, the work of the immigrant acts for, uh, in, your, in your estimation? And, and why? But it's probably a question you get a lot, but I think it's one that's useful for, for us as well to think through, which is why, why intimacy? It's a, such, a, it's such a, a, a special word. It's a, a word that we reserve for all kinds of things. Um, so to use that as a, as a kind of, um, you know, um, heuristic tool, as a, as a, as a you know, what, 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 what do we gain from that as well? Great, great questions. Well, um, I mean, in a way, the the project uh, that ended up being the intimacies of four continents was one that 
that started with my, an interest in wanting to chart Asian immigrations globally and not just simply to the US. So you've named very much what was at the beginnings of it. Um, and you know, we what we see is that, you know, from in if we look at the the British colonial archives, but it's true of the Spanish and the Dutch as well, that Asian workers, particularly Chinese workers, were always uh, constructed in relationship to enslaved Black Africans. Um, and so it's a long, complex history. It didn't just come up in 1992 with the Los Angeles uprisings, <laughs> um, you know, where Claire Jean Kim came up with this really brilliant idea of triangulation that um, that the that Asians are always positioned as a kind of intermediary race between black and white. Um, you know, she wasn't implying that there's an essential uh, quality that Asians have that permits them to be posed that way, but rather that they are often opportunistically posed in these flexible racial orders. Um, and that, you know, how Asian Americans are uh, juxtaposed with blacks and whites isn't fixed or given, but really is uh, a result of the historical conditions. Um, but in immigrant acts, I mean, excuse me, the intimacies of four continents, um, uh, it started with this 1803 memorandum uh, that I found in which the British colonial office wrote to the court of directors of the East India Company saying, you know, uh, 1803, you know, we've had these revolutions in the West Indies um, and slave revolts across the different islands. And um, in order to not have more insurrection in our colonies, will you go pick up some Chinese <laughs> who are, uh, who we could uh, call a free race of cultivators. Um, and so that began this, uh, this set of like half a century of bringing Chinese laborers to the West Indies. Um, ultimately, the Chinese were more unruly than they were fantasized to be. Um, I think they were fantasized to be a kind of docile barrier race who could be Christianized and domesticated and, and they ended up being quite unruly uh, and causing all kinds of mutinies and so forth on ships. Um, but, and then eventually because the British were uh, the colonial power in India, um, Indian indentured workers became the larger population in the West Indies, um, but uh, but so so I was interested in those in those connections. It eventually uh, brought me to think about not just the relationship between Asian indentured labor and uh, the newly emancipated, though we know the conditions continued, uh, African slaves but also to think about settler colonialism and how the, um, the abolition of slavery and the bringing of this intermediary or coerced and free racialized group, the Chinese in, was also part of uh, expanding the British empire and uh, expanding especially the, um, the imperial trades in, in East Asia and India. Um, and really the beginnings of liberalism itself <laughs> with free trade and free wage labor. So that's, that's what that book ended up being. It took, took me quite a long time to write that book <laughs> because as you can see, it ranges across a lot of, of topics. Oh, sure. I mean, you know, if you're getting into the origins of even li just liberalism and the liberal state formation itself, that's a, that's a huge project. And, and I think my, stu my students often, I, I'm often trying to re uh, remind my students that um, colonialism was a liberal project. It was not a conservative project. And so yes. just understanding that relationship, um, um, I think can actually de not just destabilize, but it can re make people rethink what the idea of our liberal state actually means. Um, well, that's what the book, that's what the book ended up being. Um, again, it wasn't necessarily what I started uh, researching, but it became clear that these liberal innovations of wage labor, citizenship, political emancipation, free trade, um, they were all in, you know, they were discourses and concepts that were intended to bring universal rights and freedom, but at the same time, 
they were clearly um, differentiating the colonizer and the colonized. Um, and also, particularly free trade and free wage labor became means for the, um, the empire to expand its maritime supremacy, to expand trade, to move away from mercantile colonialism to you know, free trade imperialism. Uh, and so without liberalism, the British empire would not have ascended to be becoming the you know, this large empire at the end of the 19th century. It's interesting because I think that you know the word that you've raised a few times here, even in our conversation, is flexibility, right? And so there's a way in which power is very flexible, um, and even colonial power is extremely flexible in, in its in its use of ideas in order to discipline various populations, to exploit various populations, and and the the sort of idea sphere of liberalism, I think, also um, projects that flexibility as well, where an idea can apply to some populations, but not others, and, and it differentiates in that same level of flexibility. So if, if, if I realize I didn't answer your intimacies question. Oh, yes. Okay, please. Um, well, um, the reason why I chose intimacy is because we often think about it as a, um, you know, we think about intimacy as interpersonal. But it's really clear that it's, uh, you know, if we're thinking about uh, the 19th century, that, that interpersonal sense of intimacy in the bourgeois household, for example, or in the 19th century novel um, is really not shared by everybody. Mm -hmm. So it, 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 it made me think about um, what other kinds of uh, hidden relationships or connections are the conditions of possibility for bourgeois intimacy, which, so that's, so the, the meaning of intimacies in um, that it, most of the book takes on is the relationship between Europe, the Americas, Africa, and Asia, and how these seemingly quite distant um, histories, continents, peoples um, are actually quite connected in that they needed to be connected by empire in order for bourgeois intimacy to take place. Whether, we talk, whether we're talking about the kinds of uh, goods that and decor that uh, decorate the bourgeois household and bedroom, or whether we're talking about the wealth itself that the bourgeoisie accumulated. So intimacy worked for me as a kind of um, a, con a tripartite concept that had on the one hand, this idea of interpersonal intimacy, but then also imperial intimacies. And then the third meaning I, I, was, I was trying to invoke was the kinds of intimacies among colonized peoples themselves. So, um, you know, of course, uh, in the West Indies, as I was just describing, you know, Chinese and India and East Indians were brought together with uh, enslaved African people, their settler uh, British settler and col colonial administrators, and they were all all together. That's another kind of intimacy. Um, it, uh, you know, I guess because I'm a student of of Edward Said's too, I, I hear echoes of his reading of Mansfield Park. Uh, uh, in Precisely, the also very inspiring. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And from culture and imperialism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll never think about Mansfield Park the same again. <laughs> yeah, this is exactly. The way that our material culture is so indebted to, and at the same time wants to turn a blind eye to its colonial pasts, right? And the, the horrors, of, especially the horrors of that colonial past. Yeah. But re returning to flexibility for a second, it's like, mm -hmm. I feel like if power is, is flexible in the way that you've, I think, articulated very, very correctly and eloquently in our conversation so far, um, you know, resistance to power must be equally flexible if it's going to succeed at all. And so, yeah, I, what I, what I, the reason why I say this is because I feel like there was this moment in Asian American studies uh, and the beginnings of Asian American studies when it was very much an insurrectionary movement coming out of these battles for ethnic studies out on the West Coast. Uh, there was a kind of flexibility that it had in order to uh, confront the systems of power that it was uh, that were dominant, and it was moving beyond the realm of the uh, the academic world only, as well, at the same time. And I wonder if there's a way in which uh, Asian American studies 
um, thinking through this idea of flexibility and, and opposition to power, uh, you know, what, what do you see as the sort of pitfalls of Asian American studies and the possibilities of Asian American studies when thinking about it in terms of what it's opposing, what it's creating? Oh, that's a very serious question. Um, I mean, I think from its beginnings, as I was um, alluding before, Asian American studies always had, um, you know, two, many more than two, but let's say, let's say broadly, two different kinds of trajectories. And one, what we might discuss as kind of uh, the need to be acknowledged and recognized and included within the existing liberal democracy um, to be represented. Um, and then I think there was always from its beginnings uh, an Asian American movement that did not want inclusion, but wanted to transform, transform, wanted transformation and wanted to transform the system of liberal democracy and representation itself. Um, that, that it wasn't enough to have civil rights, that it would, you know, many of the uh, activists in the beginning were, were against the Imperial War in Southeast Asia, for example, um, were working with the Black Panthers, were working with the American Indian Movement and so forth. So um, I would say that there was, there all, there's always been those two different kinds of uh, approaches in American, in Asian American studies. And if in the beginning it was heavier towards the, the more radical transformation, it's probably now more weighting, weighted towards the inclusiveness uh, and wanting to be um, represented. Um, we're talking about the studies now. I think Asian American movements on the ground are still, I mean, there's still plenty of radical movements who are not interested in token inclusion <laughs> and really want a rap, you know, a radical redistribution of resources who want housing, who want uh, healthcare, who want uh, protection from uh, police brutality and so forth. So, um, so I think um, Asian American studies has those different elements. Um, so some of the promise and the pitfalls would be the promises, of course, that, um, uh, you know, as we were speaking in the, the earlier session, and as Diana has been saying, I mean, there's still, there's ongoing anti-Asian racism and also the problem of, of invisibility and misunderstanding and stereotypes. Um, it's a terrible thing if new Asian American populations don't have access to studying her own history and culture. So Asian American studies is absolutely necessary and important as part of a larger program of understanding the history of colonialism and race and war. Um, you know, the pitfall is probably that uh, it's, you know, as, you know, over the last 50 years, it's become a professional field. Um, you know, so there is a way in which it's been drawn away from some of its earlier roots. Um, but, you know, I, I, I think at this point, I wouldn't stress that pitfall. I mean, that's the pitfall of, of all kinds of identity. <laughs> yeah, well, speak, speaking of which, you know, I mean, maybe, with, maybe what's important then is to understand the relationship of identity and capitalism in the capitalist state, you know, and how that relates then to racism itself. So, you know, you've also, you've said before that capitalism needs to differentiate through race, which is a very provocative and evocative statement. So I'm wondering if you could explain what you mean by that and how Asian American studies can challenge that very kind of differentiation. I'm not exactly certain in what context I said that, but I was, <laughs> <laughs> I was probably referring to the idea that capitalism profits precisely through the differentiation, the differentiated exploitation from different groups. So it, it profits from racial segmentation. It profits from divisions of labor that are uh, racially differentiated. Um, and this is really what the concept of racial capitalism is doing. I think, you know, uh, following Cedric Robinson, it's insisting that there is no pure free market economy that's external or intrinsic or extrinsic to not just racial differences, but also gendered and colonial differentiation of, of communities. 
um, and that actually existing capitalist processes operate precisely through those uneven uh, racial formations and is lived and resisted through those racial formations as well, right? I mean, Stuart Hall said, uh, how did he put it? You know, race is the modality through which classes lived. Um, so the state plays an important role in this racialization for the capitalist economy. And the most obvious example being, uh, and this is what was so interesting about writing this book on Asian Americans in relationship to giving a little history of racial capitalism is the most obvious way that the state serves capital is to prevent people from becoming citizens and yet recruiting them as labor. So then you have a, a, a labor, a, a group of people you can exploit without protecting them in any way. Um, uh, so barring certain racial or national groups from citizenship produces an exploitable labor pool uh, without giving them rights or protections. And you know, historically, racialized non-citizen labor, not historically, in an ongoing way, uh, farm workers, service workers, care workers, hospital workers. I mean, it, it's just non-citizen labor has played an enormous role in the building of the economy. Absolutely. I mean, I was I was even looking into this a little bit of um, last year. I was writing something for the for the Guardian. I forget the, in fact which piece it was. <laughs> but looking looking at um, um, even government statistics around the undocumented uh, farm workers, they, the government statistics will say that they're something like fifty to sixty percent. So even the government will admit that that's the case, although people who are on the ground will say it's probably closer to 90% of the farm workers in this country are, are undocumented. And yeah. how, much, how much of that do we depend on every single day, just eating our food? Um, yeah. and, and how much acknowledgement do we give to that very reality, that very fact? Um, and, you know, if, and that's why our tomatoes can be 20 cents cheaper, you know, and, and that all that profit going, of course, not to the workers. But, you know, also in relation to Asian Americans, what, you know, the character, the, the racial stereotype of the so-called undocumented laborer is Latinx or Central American. But there's, you know, there's a, I don't know the exact statistics, maybe Diana as a sociologist would, but, you know, there's a good 20% of the undocumented labor force that is Asian. I, it might even be higher because the, how do you report these things? People don't want to report that they're undocumented. Um, I, I, I teach a class, um, um, some, uh, every, you know, with some regularity um, in the honors section in the honors college here on uh, immigration to New York City. And uh, one of the things that I have my students do in the very beginning of that class is just write a very short um, narrative about their um, their arrival or their time in like when when did their family history uh, begin to include New York City as well mm -hmm. and um, I was shocked about how many years ago maybe a handful of years ago um, almost I would say maybe 30 to 50 percent of the class said that they they were um, they they were now citizens because of the amnesty in 1986 like they were the products of the 86 amnesty um, and they were from all over the world. So they were not, yes. you know, uh, and so I, I thought that was actually um, really, really interesting and very revealing. Uh, also in the ways in which we just don't acknowledge um, certain things um, publicly, and, uh, but they are, so, they, they are so deeply part of our, our, our country and our experiences. You know, similarly too, it's I think the, another question that I would wanna think want to ask regarding Asian American studies is thinking about the ways in which Asian American studies then thinks about critically about the ways in which Asian Americans are so often used as wedge groups within the United States too, within the sort of racial logic of the US. Uh, um, and I, I wonder if there's a way in which we can we can theorize that. Um, I mean, you, you alluded to it earlier, but I think it's something that's worth um, contemplating. And before you do um, move on to that question, I, uh, I just also want to invite people in the audience to start thinking about their own questions because uh, it, pretty soon I want to open this up to, to everybody. And so once you're, um, uh, if you have any questions that, you're, that you want to uh, pose to Professor Lisa Lowe, please, please do um, uh, put them in the chat and we'll uh, get to them. Uh, 
but yeah, uh, Lisa, you know, is there a way that we can that we can think about the ways in which um, um, Asian Americans are so often used as as a wedge group? You know, going back to Stuart Hall, you know, Stuart Hall talks about policing the crisis, thinking the, thinking about crises being so constantly deployed by the state and then using certain elements and certain populations against each other in in order then to maintain a certain kind of superiority. So yes. Uh, yeah. No, I think, I mean, this is another reason why Asian American studies is so important, is um, for Asian Americans and others, be not simply only exclusively Asian Americans, to understand how, how common it has been throughout history for Asians to be used as an as a, uh, intermediary racial group to both discipline Asians, but also to discipline brown and black people as well. Um, so, the, you know, the we often think about the model minority as starting in the 1980s, um, you know, as the, uh, you know, the Japanese auto industry is rising and so forth. Um, but really, I mean, if you look in the colonial archive, um, as, as I did for my, my last book, I mean, the colonial administrators from the 18th century onward were posing the, the Chinese against enslaved Africans. So this is a, it's a long standing colonial discourse um, and uh, the model minority or, or um, you know, as Takfu Jutani says, as rapid industri industrializing Asia is also the model modernity in certain ways. There's a way in which um, the, uh, the success of Korea, for example, South Korea, is often posed as a, a counterexample to Latin America or other countries to which the IMF and World Bank have lent lent money. So um, there's a way in which this this use of it, uh, Asia and Asian Americans as a wedge um, happens over and over again, like Orientalism. <laughs> um, and and you know the most recent examples are the campaigns to ban affirmative action, which have been right wing campaigns to ban affirmative action, which have appealed to, uh, I mean, the arguments they've used is that Asian, there have been quotas for Asian admissions. Um, another recent example is this Asian hate crime bill, um, which of course, you know, there've been horrifying assaults on, on Asian Americans as a result of, uh, you know, Trump fanning the flames of the so-called Wuhan virus and so forth. Um, but this, you know, this horrifying and the Atlanta murders as well as the murders in Indianapolis um, and these sensationalized street assaults on Asians. But Asians have faced anti-Asian violence throughout history. And um, this, uh, this notion that um, there needs to be a hate crime bill to stop it uh, suggests that um, Asians are passive victims that need the state and police buildup to protect them, as opposed to you know many of the Asian activist groups. I think as many as eighty uh, recently made a statement saying they did not want after the Atlanta murders for uh, for the solution to be the buildup of police. That um, so if, you know one one of those organizations, Red Canary Song, for example. Um, which works with and provides services to um, massage parlor workers, um, you know, said, we, you know, not only uh, would we rather have um, Asian communities, Asian immigrant communities supported by better wages, by health care, by child care, by social services, by not rating us, uh, not having the ICE rate us. We, we, we feel endangered by the buildup of police, and it pits us against other minority groups who we know are disproportionately criminalized, like Black Americans. Um, so, so Red Canary Song is one group, but you know, there even more mainstream Asian American civil rights groups have said that's not the solution to anti-Asian violence. So that's another, I think, uh, more disturbing way in which um, anti-Asian violence has been kind of hijacked to use Asian Americans as a wedge issue in order to uh, build up prison budget, uh, prison and policing budgets. Through the kind of like a kind of liberal paternalism of the state at the same time. So yes. I mean, 
it's, it's interesting how I think critiques of liberalism are also um, coming up through this conversation in, in productive ways. <laughs> so thank you. Um, I, I, I think now would be a perfect time to in fact, open up the, the floor to, to questions. Um, um, I know I've heard enough of my voice in this conversation. So maybe <laughs> others have uh, things that they wanna add. Um, it looks like we have a question in the chat, but I wanted to go back to something Lisa said um, in the earlier session that someone had posed, and I think this is a good space to um, address this, is, is your role in Asian American studies, if you could talk a little bit more about that experience, someone had asked that um, earlier, you know, you had said UCSD didn't have Asian American studies when you had first gotten there, and you know, what was that experience like? I think this ties in with James's question here, Right, what advice you give to people trying to start an Asian American studies program? Well, um, I was very lucky, you know, at that time, um, we, uh, scholars like Rosario Sanchez, Ramon Gutierrez, George Lipsitz, and others, Yen Espiritu, um, you, oh, no, actually Yen was the first hire in the, the new ethnic studies program. Um, you know, we were able to get together and, um, you know, work with uh, one another to ask for uh, an ethnic studies program to be, to be developed. Uh, Ramon Gutierrez played a very big role in this. Um, and um, yeah, I think the, the advice I would give is that it's very important to um, organize students and faculty. I mean, I think student demand is very important, but faculty uh, collective voice is very important and also faculty willingness to build the curriculum and do the hiring and um, retrain in many cases. You know, for, for example, with me, I wasn't trained to teach Asian American studies, but it, it seemed like a very urgent and important and necessary thing to do. You know, the other side of it too, I think that sometimes um, people who are new to the um, conceptualizing the field is to think about the relationship between California and the rest of the country when it comes to Asian American studies. In fact, people are often surprised that there's even an organization called East of California when it comes to Asian American studies. Uh, so I wonder if there's also a way that, that you, you might have some um, thoughts on that. Well, it's, um, it's so interesting because, you know, as I was saying in the earlier session that Diana was referring to, UCLA and Berkeley and San Francisco State had Asian American Studies and Ethnic Studies by the 1969. Um, other campuses like UC San Diego, where I was, didn't uh, establish it until the 1980s. But um, I was very surprised to come to the East Coast and realize that there's so, so there's much less, let's put it that way. Um, and, uh, and recently this morning, President Anderson said that Brooklyn College is, is planning to establish Asian American studies. So that's wonderful to hear. Um, but, uh, but this is a, you know, this is, you will have the latecomers advantage that you can, <laughs> you can establish it in the ways that fit best with your setting. Um, but I think there's a, you know, it's, it, it, it goes without saying, I think this is obvious to everybody who works in this area that um, California really is a very different situation for Asian American studies, simply because of the demographic strength of Asian Americans. <clears throat> UCLA and UC Berkeley are over 50% Asian American students in the student body. Um, and uh, Asian Americans have and Asian immigrants have been in California since the 19th century. So uh, it's different than on the, in, in the Northeast where, or Mid-Atlantic where the populations are more recent. Um, so I think it's, it's a very different situation organizing out here. Absolutely. And, and the, um, um, also the, uh, the, the, the types of populations, Asian, Asian American populations that we have here in, in the East Coast are different than they are on the West Coast. And the relationship to labor and, and, um, and settlement are also uh, different. And, um, so I, I think that there's maybe that's also something that we should be paying attention to. At the same time, one of the strengths, I think, of a lot of the work at Brooklyn College is the ways in which the, the Brooklyn College uh, attempts to and often succeeds in connecting to um, the communities around the college and in the borough. 
So I wonder if there's a way in which connecting to um, the sort of Asian American, not just communities, but Asian American movements around the city would be a way of also thinking about how to get away from just liberal inclusion and into a more transformative politics and, uh, and study, which was also going back to James Kim's question. That's the reason why I'm, I'm raising this, just to return briefly to the question. Yes, that's a wonderful, wonderful suggestion. And um, I mean, it seems like a way to um, really connect what happens in the classroom to living communities in the city. It, they would be crazy not to do that. <laughs> and I mean, I, you know, in a way, what it makes me think is also that there is not, and this is obvious, but I'm just going to be flat footed. There's not a single Asian American history. It's so regional. It's so specific to when you're speaking of it and which era you're, you're looking at. Um, we can try to draw some uh, broad through lines, but uh, that would be a, a, an amazing thing to make to to make Asian American studies about Asian Americans in New York, um, and to teach it in that way would be amazing. And do do Arab Americans count in Asian American studies? Well, it you know what do you think? I mean, I still remember you coming to Asian American studies all those years, yeah. um, because there wasn't, you know, it, it seemed like the, the uh, I mean, what went into your decision to do your work in Asian American studies? Yeah, for sure. I mean, like, you know, these days, the uh, people in Arab American studies avoid the term Middle East. The Middle East is so colonial as a term, right? Yes. The, the other term that's often used is MENA, which still has Middle East in it, Middle East, North Africa. But the better term is SWANA. Yes. Southwest Asia, North Africa. It's purely just geographic. It has no colonial like um, origin for it, no, no center point. But if you look at that word, Swana, it seems to me that there is an Asia in that word, Southwest Asia. So yes. why not? I mean, I, it feels like these should be capacious categories that are actually much more about what, what happens when, when um, we're bringing communities into, into um, um, dialogue with each other and into understanding rather than walling off identity formation and saying that this group belongs here and that group belongs there. I couldn't agree more. But I don't wanna take up all the, uh, the, the air in the room because we have some great questions coming out here. Um, Are you reading them, Diana? I haven't had a chance to read them. Yeah, I'm reading them. Um, Joseph asks, you know, one of the powerful aspects of Immigrant Acts is the way the book uses Asian American as a critical, as a key critical term and also complicates that term with a focus on its internal heterogeneity, hybridity and complexity. Can you say a bit about that tension or balance which is both political and analytical? What a great question. Um, I mean, I think what Mustafa is saying actually fits as a practical example that, um, you know, I think Asian American uh, emerged as a as a political term. Nobody's born Asian American. They uh, they identify with um, a coalition or a group of people who share some kinds of histories or uh, uh, interventions in common. Um, but uh, but it's not an essence. It's not a um, it's not a universal or unified category. Um, and so I think it's really important to, uh, to, to always have that, that doubleness. On the one hand, it's a, it's a strategic category for making certain interventions about the ways in which um, immigrant, immigrants from East, Southwest, West, <laughs> and South Asia and Southeast Asia have been racialized and, um, and othered in times of war. Uh, but it's not as if uh, there, there are common uh, cultures, languages, and so forth. It's not that kind of cultural identity. Um, so I think it's both a strategic um, category to be deployed, but also must always be attended to for what it excludes um, and not be um, reified as an identity. That's a, a you know, uh, the, the first line at Simone de Beauvoir's The Second Sex is uh, one is not born, but rather becomes a woman. Mm -hmm. You could say one is not born, but rather becomes an Asian American. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I'm just going down the list here. Uh, Mackenzie wants to know, you know, would you say the exposure to the public took a step forward when it comes to shedding light on Asian American studies and how some people are uneducated on the obstacles Asian Americans had to overcome, whether it's economic exploitation, racism, et cetera? What, uh, I, when I, was this step forward taken? <laughs> yes, I, I'm looking for that clarity as well. Um, is this about most recently? Mackenzie, you can feel free to, to chat, type in the chat and I can um, address that. I don't see it. Okay, as Mackenzie's thinking about that. Um, so Laura is asking about Asian American studies um, more generally and how resistance at public universities is well known among um, Asian Americans on the East Coast in particular. Can you speak about the issue of educational equity and how the lack of such equates to an anti-Asian violence we see today, as well as discrimination that persists due to ignorance of the lived experiences of Asian Americans? Um, Asian Americans are the poorest Irish demographic in New York City. Their data is not disaggregated, and so they're often seen as a monolithic group. Could you speak to how Asian American studies could help resolve these issues and how long you think it might take for education to improve our society in this way? <laughs> As a well, I definitely think that um, disaggregation of data is a kind of um, quantitative analog to breaking down stereotypes of monolithic groups. Um, so disaggregating the data is important so that um, you know, Asians aren't, but I mean, it's, it's, it's important part of this whole, um, you know, deconstructing of the model minority myth and so forth that um, there are so many different national origin groups, but also the, the date of one's immigration, one's immigration history, how distant one is from the immigrating generation, or if one is new immigrants themselves, um, class, gender, sexuality, uh, religious, secular, um, you know, citizen, non-citizen, refugee, undocumented. Um, there's so many differences among this large group, Asian American. So again, we don't want to get into the, uh, you know, the convenience of adopting a census category because it's the only way to become visible. Um, we have to keep that detail and that texture and that difference and learn about one another. Um, even though you know it's necessary to group under this this banner. Okay, and I wanted to come back to thank you for that. I come back to McKinsey's question. I, I think this is within the context of. Um, more recent exposures right here. So he, here he says, well, over the recent months, I've been hearing more and more about hate crimes and how the movement is bringing more exposure to the public. So perhaps what's going on, you know, currently during, um, because of COVID, do you think that has affected people's perceptions about Asian Americans and um, disparities in income, racism, et cetera? Well, I do think it has, particularly for non-Asians, um, you know, brought Asian Americans to light, but I think there are some real dangers for, in the ways in which it has brought Asians to light. Um, I'll just say anecdotally, I mean, as I've already implied, um, it, it, it represents Asians as passive victims of violence who need protection by the state. Um, it renders invisible the longstanding social movements who have wanted independence from the state. Um, it also uh, renders invisible this much longer history going back to the 19th century in which Asians have always encountered uh, violence. Um, you know, in the earlier session, I was talking about the late 19th century when, um, when Asians were the object of, you know, mob vigilante violence um, and, um, and it was very much about that also being a time of political and economic crisis. When um, with the abolition of slavery, the US economy moving from uh, a cotton-based agricultural economy to a, a, a continental industrial manufacturing economy and it needed railroads and it needed mining and metals. Um, so uh, there's a way in which time after time, Asians have been targeted um, so this, this new 
not new, this quote unquote new anti-Asian violence. Of course, it's 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 horrifying, but it's not new. And what's what's sort of disturbing is the way in which it is publicized as, oh, look, we didn't even know Asians existed and now they're the object of violence. Um, um, I, re I ran into my colleague, Gary Okahiro, who Mustafa mentioned, and he was just tearing his hair out and saying, what, did they never hear of Vincent Chen? <laughs> and, um, you know, in other words, it's both, yes, it's good that uh, people are understanding um, Asians are, are vulnerable as a racial, racialized minority. But what's, what's problematic and difficult is that it should be um, only delivered as a soundbite on social media or on the news rather than as a long historical dynamic that also involves the, the building of the nation state and other racialized groups, which I think would be the, the ideal way to present it. You know, if I could just jump in briefly too, just to make an analogy with, with Arab and Muslim Americans as well, because there was, uh, uh, you know, I, I've been talking about Arab and Muslim Americans uh, for, the, the, for the length of my career. And of course, <laughs> after 2001, it became even more uh, uh, of, a, of an issue. Um, but what I've encountered over those, all of those years too, is that people often want to talk about hate crimes um, but they don't want to talk about state crimes yes. when it comes to Arab Americans, Muslim Americans. And there's a way in which focusing on hate crimes actually absolves you of having to talk about state crimes. And I think that that's actually, when it comes to especially to Arab Muslim Americans, the, the state has been much more deleterious to our existence than, than the hate crimes. Not, not to say that the hate crimes are not horrible, of course they are, but if we don't understand that relationship between the two, then we're just doomed to, you know, in, into these passive formations and repetitions of all of these kinds of violence too. So, I, you know, I think that that is also a way to, un, to try to get beyond this, this horrible moment and, and to make something transformative more. Um, and that, that is by paying more attention to what the role of the state in all of this is as well. Exactly. And also the idea of, I mean, you mentioned Stuart Hall and policing the crisis. I mean, there's been for a long time um, the, the, you know, this, this process of the state withdrawing from social welfare and, you know, providing for schools, housing, healthcare. Um, so there's a, there's, a there's a way in which the state wants to address it's the gap between the promise of freedom and rights and the actual inequality by creating more policing <laughs> and funding policing rather than social welfare. Um, uh, and, um, you know, that, that the idea of hate, well, so not just the idea, the language, I recently heard Naomi Murakawa talking about this, the language of hate crimes becomes a way to um, buttress the criminal justice system. Um, it's not about remedying, it's not giving more resources for Asian American communities. It's a way of um, uh, fueling an already aggressive criminal justice system that we know disproportionately arrests and criminalizes and, in, and, and is violent to Black Americans. So here's an opportunity for Asian Americans to, I, to ally and have solidarity cross-racially in relationship to state crimes. But if they are constructed as a passive victim that needs police or prison help, then it instantly makes that coalition difficult to have. And then even sometimes those people, those very same people will be um, not just put through the criminal justice system, but given in some states, given the option between um, going to prison or going into the military. And then that ends up fueling then American military uh, power uh, abroad, which then has other implications for Asian populations, which then comes back to the US in other kinds of ways too. So that level of international, uh, uh, that view, international view, I think is also important to this. Yes. So I see an, uh, an, a question here, how do we address actual victims? The high level view ignores real life reality and exchange. It's not a high level view. I think it's a, you know, I mean, to take the 
the cue from a group like Red Canary Song. They would rather have a minimum wage law. They would rather have funded childcare. They would rather not be raided by ICE and have their workers attacked or raped by police officers. So I do think that the way we address actual victims doesn't necessarily have to be through criminalization of the, the supposed perpetrators. It can also be through um, more robust resources for working people and immigrant working people. I think that allows us to look at these inter intersections, right, and interconnections, um, what um, Mustafa has said earlier. I think, let's see, I'm trying to see where we are. Um, I, so one last question um, from Na Young. Thank you so much for invigorating conversations. As much as the materiality of racialization is important and necessary to highlight, I would like to hear your take on what the significance of effects and emotions for Asian Americans or in Asian American studies would be. Um, since I feel like your book, The Intimacies of Four Content, touches upon a sort of affective aspects or, or qualities. So how might, how might one react or, or absorb, I, I suppose, um, racialization? Well, you know, um, that's not one of the valences of intimacies that I actually take up or, or study is affect. Um, But, you know, I feel like, I mean, Chris Kwok, I want to be respectful to this person, Chris Kwok. I mean, I think that there is grief and anger um, around the kinds of terrible attacks on Asian Americans. And, um, and that is something that we are, are dealing with. Um, I, I've read recently, the sociologist Janelle Wong has been studying um, the anti-Asian hate crimes. And what she's found out is that, in fact, um, you know, most the ways in which the hate crimes have been, or the, not the hate crimes, but the assaults or the attacks have been represented, actually um, have exaggerated certain things. Most of the people, first of all, Asian Americans haven't been attacked more than other racial groups in this COVID period, even though it's been constructed th that way. Also, most of the attacks haven't been on elders. It's actually been on the full range of ages. And most of the attacks or, or reported incidents of racism have not been physical assaults. They've been interpersonal uh, circumstances, uh, speech and so forth. Um, so I think that, um, you know, the, we do, you know, we do have grief and horror about what's happened and it is a terrible thing. Um, and I didn't mean to diminish that. I meant to think, put it in the longer history of how, you know, something like the hate crimes bill, um, you know, yes, it's a certain kind of Asian American empowerment, but that really wasn't authored only by Asian Americans. It was supported by police departments. It was a bill that was lobbied by police departments. Thank you for that, um, Lisa. And I'm looking at the time here and I just wanna really thank Lisa and Mustafa for an invigorating and insightful conversation. Um, please do register for other HESS events. We are here um, all week with, and, and the next one is at 5 p.m. Um, this evening on, on Pedagogy. So please come and join us. Thank you so much for joining today.